Today we have something very special for you. In this video, we're going to analyze the beat of Hunter by Björk, the opening track of a brilliant 1997 album Homogenic. The drums were programmed by techno pioneer Mark Bell, who collaborated with Björk on the album. He only used two instruments, kick and snare, but the result is one of the most interesting, expressive and masterfully programmed 909 drum patterns I've come across yet. You won't need a 909 though, we'll build everything from scratch on this sequencer, so you can recreate this on any drum machine or in your DAW. Let's get started. Hello everyone, this is... Hunter has a tempo of 160 BPM. We'll start with the snare. A big part of what makes this pattern so special is its use of the 909's different accent levels. Let's take a closer look. This velocity is what the 909 knows as an accented step. But instead of all the snare hits having the same strength, we'll turn these into unaccented, weaker steps. On the 909 there was also a third option. With the so-called total accent, you were able to globally add even more oomph to any instrument that's on a specific step. And that's what we'll do here on beat 1 and 3, steps 1 and 9, by giving them the maximum velocity. Now it's not a monotonous hammering anymore. There's a noticeable movement, a crescendo or swelling. Makes it sound a lot more primal and menacing. The pattern has four bars that all start like this. So let's unroll the sequence to 64 steps. Let's move to page 2. I'll always place loop points around the current bar, so we can listen to it in isolation. In addition to what we had in bar 1, bar 2 will end with a roll. Again, increasing in velocity. The end of bar 3 has two snare hits on steps 14 and 15. An accented hit, followed by an unaccented one. Bar 4 concludes with even more rapid fire on the snare. These are unaccented until here, then they go up right before the bar ends, so everything ties together neatly when this loops back to bar 1. But there's also a small change in the first half. This series of hits starts unaccented and in turn goes up in volume one step earlier. Let's listen to the finished snare pattern. Basically, this is the same phrase over and over again, but each time with a distinct variation at the end, which keeps it from getting boring even when it's repeated a lot. So, on to the kick. I'll mute the snare until we're done, so you can focus. The general idea for the kick pattern in every bar is this. It plays on the one, and mainly during the second half of the bar. The one always gets a total accent, and the others keep oscillating between no accent and accent most of the time. And from one bar to the next, there's always a change from a more relaxed, expanded phrase to a rapid-fire series of kicks. So, for bar 2 this means the usual total accent on step 1, and then we start firing a series of oscillating kicks from step 10 onwards. Bar 3 is again more relaxed. Apart from the total accent on step 1, there are only three accented eighth notes in the second half. Bar 4 then in turn answers with more rapid fire. During the intro, the first half gets an unaccented kick on step 3, which leads to an interesting result. Listen to this. This unaccented hit chokes the preceding stronger total accent, as if you were muting the drum head by putting your flat hand onto it. The finished kick pattern sounds like this. Now all we have to do 
is bring both parts together. One final touch. I'll pan the kick hard left and the snare hard right. And now the pattern unfolds its full effect. Do you notice how the kick and snare start talking to each other? There's almost a call and response thing going on between the two. Quite hypnotic. This interaction is of course helped by the fact that they're on opposite sides of the stereo field. Both instruments are anchored by their common total accent on the first beat of each bar. And the snare doubles that pulse with the total accent on the third beat as well. Whenever you see recreations of Hunter on YouTube, this pattern is conveniently left out or grossly simplified. And for good reason, this is about as rhythmically complicated as it will ever get on a 909. Buckle up, we need a battle plan for this. This is the rhythm as it is played in the original. Four bars. Every diamond represents a drum hit. Once more on half speed. If we add a 16th note grid to this, we start to see some problems. In bar 1, everything's fine and dandy. Business as usual with regular 16th notes. In bar 2, this works up until here. But the next notes aren't on the grid. How can we solve this? The 909 didn't have microtiming, so the steps couldn't have been nudged to the side. But we can change the pattern scale. Scale in this case doesn't refer to a musical scale, but to a tempo multiplier that makes the sequencer play a pattern at a different speed. For example, 3 quarters, or 75% of the original speed. Which gives us a grid with 8th note triplets. You might ask yourself, but what about this rogue kick drum hit? Well, it does not fit onto any of the available grids, but fortunately, there's a simple explanation for it. The TR909 was Roland's first drum machine with a flam feature. A flam step plays two drum hits in quick succession. And that's what this is. If you activate flam for this kick, the second softer hit will land right here. The triplet grid doesn't work for long though. Here we have to switch back to 16th notes. And then back to 8th note triplets again. And back to 16ths. And as if constantly hopping between two different scales wasn't enough, we're going to need a third one. These double hits are not flams, but 32nd note rolls. And because you don't have substeps on a 909, they can only be placed if you set the pattern scale to a 32nd. The sequencer then plays the pattern at double speed, which gives us double the resolution, but of course also eats up double the amount of steps. So, let's go over our shopping list for this unholy pattern sandwich. We have 24 steps in 16th scale. The 909 is limited to 16 steps per pattern, so we could split this 12-12. Then we have 3 steps in 8th triplet scale, 4 steps in 16th scale, 6 steps in 8th triplet scale, 8 steps in 16th scale, and 32 steps in 32nd scale, which have to be split into 2 patterns. And then you have to chain everything together in song mode. Look, I'm not happy about this either. When I finished transcribing this part, I thought there was no way Mark Bell used the internal sequence of the 909 for that. But Björk has emphasized in her podcast that Mark did indeed program the beat using only a 909. It drove me insane that I couldn't find a more elegant solution. But this is the only one I can come up with that doesn't involve sacrificing a goat to some omnipotent drum machine demon. And Björk said that Mark Bell did the beat in one take. I mean, sure, the first pattern, but this? This is premeditated murder. By all means, if you have any other explanation, please let me know in the comments. You know it's probably going to be in the first comments when we release the video. You're going to look really stupid. Okay, thanks for the help, I guess. Look, I'm not going to torture you by programming all this with the restrictions of a 40-year-old sequencer. If your sequencer supports microtiming, then you can just use that to nudge the steps into an off-grid position. For example, 
This is bar 2 without microtiming. Everything is quantized to the 16th note grid. Sounds pretty much like something from the previous pattern. But if we now grab what's supposed to be the flammed snare drum hit and move it to the right by a bit more than 50% or a 32nd note, and we grab what are supposed to be the triplet notes on both the kick and snare and move them to the right by 66% or a 24th note, then this will also lead to the desired result, but way easier. There are other options as well. The Hapex, for example, offers a triplet view, which changes the zoom level to a base of 3. Here you can place triplets very comfortably. The snare rolls in bar 4 are of course no problem at all on modern sequences. They're often called substeps, retricks or ratchets. Set the roll to a 32nd note division for the duration of 1 16th note. That's the same as two substeps. All technical aspects aside, we shouldn't forget why we went through all this trouble. Listen to this in context with the previous pattern. Thanks to all those flourishes, the triplets and rolls, this part becomes even more energetic. It literally breaks out of the grid that the rest of the song is in. It creates a sense of urgency and anticipation as it leads from the intro into the verse. And with it, there are also some changes to the sounds happening. At the beginning, the kick starts out with a good amount of decay. You can clearly hear its weight as it rings out. Before pattern 2 starts, reduce the decay so the kick still has punch, but it ends more abruptly. Now there's more room for the other elements that are about to come. The snare starts out with a snappy parameter turned all the way down. This means the characteristic noise component is completely gone. This doesn't sound like a snare anymore, more like a higher kick or a tom. Right before pattern 2, turn down the snare decay a bit, and then during pattern 2, raise the snappy value. You could almost think that one instrument is replaced by another if you didn't know this was the snare. These kinds of sound transformations keep happening during the entire song. So keep your hands on those knobs to bring more expressiveness into the kick and snare. There are a few other patterns, mostly one-shots, but those aren't nearly as complex or important to the song. Plus it would be a bit boring for you to just watch me punch them in. It's simply more of what we already programmed. If you're interested, you can find all drum patterns on our Patreon. But we also play them in the end jam and we'll make sure to show the sequence during those bits. A big shout out to all of our patrons. Thanks to you, we can keep making these videos.
Bunny. Look, I need to know how Mark Bell programmed the second pattern. That'll be one goat, please. 